Honourable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I'd like to thank Mr. Speaker all who have risen to speak to this, and in particularly my colleagues in the New Democratic Party, who are making a valiant attempt to try to persuade the government that what we should be doing is respecting the hard work at committee and to respect the, the consensus that's reached. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd have to say at the outset that uh, the previous uh, speaker before me, um, I appreciate his optimism, but frankly, my experience has been since the majority government came in control, um, hard work that is done in committee seems to be going for naught. And um, I will hope that the government will take heed um, I would think that there's an indication that they chose not to include the consensus amendments, <coughs> that it's going to be an uphill battle in order to get those back in. But uh, we look forward to being surprised. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, Canadians would be shocked to discover that under the current law, and even with the passage of C-15, many who have bravely served our country, supporting democratic processes, due process and rule of law for this nation and other nations may obtain a criminal record through a system that lacks due process available in civilian criminal courts to other Canadians. Bill C-15 is the most recent of over a half dozen tabled iterations that the government let die. So from that standpoint, what is the rush? We should spend time in the committee, and if the amendments previously were valid, then let's discuss if they're still valid. The changes that were brought forward previously and were continued to call for were put forward not just by uh, opposition members, by, by Justice Lesage, uh, the for, a former Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, Professor um, Michael Drapeau, University of Ottawa, a noted author and military lawyer. Um, members of the armed forces, and uh, many legal experts and defense counsel for military members. And that while some of the needed reforms are included in C-15, we've been clear about that, regrettably, many of the most important ones are not. In 2003, uh, retired Supreme Court Justice uh, Antonio Lemaire provided a report outlining uh, 88 recommendations to reform the system of military justice and bring it into the 21st century. He was determined, he was retained to undertake a review of the court martial procedures under the National Defense Act and did issue a report, again with 88 recommendations related to military justice, military police complaints commission, grievances procedures, and the provost marshal. As a member of, uh, as, as one of my colleagues have stated, Bill C-15 is a step in the right direction. The rationale has been provided by uh, uh, the government, yet no rationale, Mr. Speaker, has been provided by the government as to why, at this point in time, in this iteration, they have now thrown out the majority of the agreed amendments. Why are they, as retired Colonel uh, Michael Drapeau, and noted legal expert and author of military justice has commented, the National Defense Act requires more than tweaks and tinkering to bring it into the 21st century. And Mr. Speaker, this is what we have before us today. Yes, there are some amendments. Yes, they're worthwhile. But it's still tweaking and tinkering rather than bringing forward a bill which is appropriate to this century. In this century, is it not time that the military courts and grievance procedures were amended to instill independence in the decision makers, judicial independence, trial by peers, and penalties on par with those in the civilian courts to other Canadians. I wish to echo, Mr. Speaker, the sentiments of the, members, of the member for Windsor Tecumseh, who clearly presented his rationale for opposing Bill C-15. As he stated in the House, Mr. Speaker, I am never going to vote for a bill that would treat our military personnel unfairly. And Mr. Speaker, that is the stance of all of my colleagues in the official opposition. And the member second stated, the second reason he was voting against it, that was that despite the efforts of the committee members of the last parliament to agree on amendments, the experience under this majority government has been continually, um, where we seek all party consensus, the PMO overrides and rejects that consensus. So many in the House, Mr. Speaker, have noted the many iterations 
prior to this bill. Uh, we had the Lemaire report in 2003 outlining um, significant thoughtful changes to bring um, the military tribunals into the century. Um, in 2000, 2006, we had C7, died on the order paper. In March 2008, we had C45, died on the order paper. In 2008, we had C60 on court martials. That was given royal assent. There we had a little tinkering, and that was good. One change made, but did not do overall reforms, as had been recommended by Justice Lemaire. There then was a Senate report on equal uh, justice for court martials in May 2009. Then again, in 2010, we had C41. Um, the government tabled one amendment, died on the order paper. Then we had C16 in 2011. Um, they passed narrow provisions to improve the appointment and tenure of military judges, but again, just a tinkering at the edges. In March 2011, the Minister of Defence commissioned yet another review by uh, Justice Lesage. Mr. Speaker, it's time for a full, all-encompassing reform of the military justice regime. It is not merely the opposition saying this. It has been senior judges. It has been military law experts. It has been representatives of the military. It has been said over and over again and has been agreed to by all party members of the committee. Despite the six iterations, including this one, since 2003, little concrete action has been taken to expedite a more just and equitable trial process for military accused. Well, Bill C-15 does provide, and as we have said, and my colleagues have reiterated to questions from, from the other side of the House, we do agree that it does provide another measures, including greater flexibility in sentencing, uh, more sentencing options, including absolute discharge, restitution, intermittent sentences, good measures, modifies the composition of court-martial panels, um, and changes the power of delegation of the power of the Chief of Defence Staff for grievance procedures, and good on them for agreeing to make some of those changes. But unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, the bill falls short in key issues, in reforming summary trials, in reforming the grievance system, and in strengthening military, the Military Complaint Commission. Only 28, Mr. Speaker, only 28 of Mr. Justice Lemaire's 88 recommendations to improve military justice, the Military Complaints Commission, the grievance procedures, and the Provost Marshal have been addressed. Many amendments tabled by the New Democrats and, frankly, put forward by the Armed Forces, passed at committee, um, have been excluded from C-15. The authority, for example, of the Chief of Defence Staff in grievance pro processes. Changes to the composition of grievance committees, and as my colleague uh, previously mentioned, to include 60% civilians. Or to ensure that the persons convicted at summary trial are not unfairly subjected to criminal record, particularly when we're dealing with minor offences. Some of the reforms that are needed that we have brought forward previously and why we think that this bill cannot be supported. Reforms to the summary trial system, reforms to the grievance system, and strengthening the Military Police Complaint, Complaint Commission. In the area of the summary trial system, and again, these are matters that were tabled at committee and agreed to, but are not found in C-15. To remove the criminal record for um, um, an expanded list of minor offenses. So in other words, there are a good number of offences where a young member of the military could be found to be given a criminal record where it's deemed inappropriate. It wouldn't happen in the civil system. Again, no right of appeal, no transcript, no access to counsel, and often the judge is the accused commanding officer. Um, Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, major reforms to the grievance system uh, should be reconstituted with civilian members. Um, and strengthening the Military Police uh, Complaints Commission, it provides to provide uh, oversight. In closing, Mr. Speaker, it's a question of justice and equity for our dedicated military. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions and comments? Question and commentaire. Uh, député de Sherbrooke. The Honourable Member for Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to be able to uh, ask a question to my colleague who asked me one earlier. So, 
you know, in the UK, as we said earlier, Australia, New Zealand have all, all, have all decided to uh, change this process. So we are wondering why Canada has been uh, dragging its feet. Because I, what I mentioned earlier, does she think the process should be improved? And if so, does she see any hope of having those amendments adopted by the government? which before had accepted them in committee when it was in a minority position in the previous parliament. So does she have any hope that these three amendments, uh, including the one uh, about the judicial process, will be adopted by the government? Or uh, does she have any hope at all, rather, of, uh, ha of having them approved? Or Edmonton Strathcona. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his question. Quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, the issue about ho hope is not for the members of the opposition. It's for the members of the armed forces. Can they possibly have hope that this time the government will do the right thing? That this time, in the sixth iteration of reforms to this legislation, why in heaven's name they have not simply taken upon themselves to listen to the testimony, including by military personnel, and bring forward a full <laughs> encompassing um, reform package to the military justice system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for St. Jean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My colleague from Edmonton, Strathcona, among other things, I talked about the fact that we are seeking a summary, a conviction process that uh, is more transparent. But another thing we have to look at is the fact that we want this process, which can lead to a, uh, a criminal record in the, on the civilian side, now that the legal process leading up to that also has to be fair in the military world, and that is not what is in place right now. So I would like her to comment on the other aspect, which is not only over, that we need an overall fair process, but also a process that is comparable between the military justice system, because the military system has an impact with regard to violations on criminal, cor cor uh, criminal records on the uh, civilian side. And Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his question. Essentially, um, as many of the members in the House have been remonstrating, we're finding it hard to see why those who put their lives on the line and are actually sent to other nations to try to protect their democratic institutions where they are struggling to have a rule of law and a fair, just process. How can it be that we cannot apply the same kind of system that we have the right and privilege of as civilians in this country to the members of our armed forces? So, frankly, we have yet to hear any genuine defense from the government as to why they think that our armed forces should be made second-class citizens in going through due process. Surely they <laughs> deserve and merit the same judicial processes and definitely in uh, summary conviction that we do as civilians. Uh, we have an, enough time for a brief question. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for St. Jean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So another aspect that is very interesting is the fact that other countries uh, that are also part of the Commonwealth have amended their legislation concerning summary uh, trials. For example, Ireland and other countries. And that was because it was the European Court of Justice that had ruled that uh, the summary conviction trials in their form at the time did not comply with legislation on human rights in Europe. So what I would like to know from my colleague is, given that Australia and New Zealand, which are not bound by European legislation, nonetheless, to, nonetheless Decide, opted for this route to make their legislation compatible with this request from the European Court of Justice. So why wouldn't Canada do so? For Edmonton Strathcona, a short response, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his question. He, he, he provides really difficult questions. 
Um, surely it's obvious. Uh, we simply look at, you know, the, the military mission in Afghanistan recently, where our armed forces are serving alongside many uh, soldiers from many other countries. Surely it makes sense that, that when they're in the field of war, that they are within the same kind of, of rationale and, and, and processes for justice. So frankly, um, I cannot present any rationale for why we would be out of step with most of the democracies of the Western world. I guess we have to put that question to the government. Resuming debate.